good morning, Agape Church. And so, uh, yeah, what do we think? Stage set up pretty good. What a great transition. Thank you guys so much for helping us bring the couches in from the lobby. If you were outside in the lobby sitting on the couches, we're sorry to take your seat, but we have plenty in here. And so that is, uh, that's good. So we're glad to have you guys with us. So um, before we get started, I want to introduce to you all our panel for this morning. We're excited about this. So we'll start over here. We have our campus pastors, Jeff and Kim Gwinnett. Round of applause for them. Now, Jeff and Kim, you guys have been campus pastors for a few months now. Yeah? Good. Everything, everything's going, you know, great, right? It's just no yeah. expectations through the roof. A hundred percent. Now, over here, we have Josh Pugh, who is running. Yes, round of applause for old Joshy. Now, look, you got to be careful with Josh because every two or three years, he actually cuts his hair. And you will have an, and then you'll be mistaken in the lobby. And you're like, hi, welcome to Agape Church. Who are you? It's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we have Becky uh, Hooper, one of our OGs here at Agape. Been with uh, Agape Church since day one. Um, Becky uh, is a trustee uh, for Agape, as well as runs the women's ministry right now. And for those of you who do not know who I am, I'm Russell Delk. I uh, serve also as a trustee for Agape Church. My wife and I are children's directors here at Agape Church. Um, so what we want to do today, guys, is we have a couple of questions, just as, as Pastor James has been uh, doing, you know. Um, and so I'm going to pose a couple of questions. The first question is actually for everyone. Okay, so the question is, is how do you recognize the voice of God or the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life and decision making? I'd say um, for me, the main way that I'm led by the Spirit or I know it's the Lord speaking is my flesh will initially try to like react. And so it would be a situation, whether it's the Lord calling me to speak to someone, whether it's the Lord giving me direction for something, uh, my flesh will initially try to like be like, no, don't do that. Don't, uh, that's, not, that's not what you need to do. And when I know that little sense of uncomfortableness, it's that walking out in the water moment where it's like, oh, I don't want to go out there. I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. And yeah. I'm, I'm generally, uh, there's a lot kind of going on in my life. Like there's a lot of places to be, a lot of things that are on my mind. And it's always kind of like Kim's talking about just this peaceful voice. It's just like, hey, do this. And I'm like, oh, I know what that is. Um, so generally, it's just, it's that. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Thank you, guys. Okay, so for the second question, um, and, I'll, and I'll start this one, but when did you recognize that God was calling you to serve in a leadership role, and what steps did you take to act on what you were feeling? Um, so for me, it was several years ago. I had just started Agape, uh, coming to Agape Church, and I started coming to Agape Church in 2012, and then I got involved in, in the Agape Kids ministry, just serving. And I recognized that there was not a Christmas program for the kids. Now, if you know me at all, Christmas is a big deal, okay? It's a big, it's a big, big deal. Decorating the whole music, the whole thing. And I love Christmas. And so I, I called Nisi, who was children's director at the time, and she go, and I said, hey, Nisi, has, has Agape ever had um, a Christmas program? for the kids. And she said, well, no. And I said, I think I'd like to, to lead one. Now, again, from tradition, you tell a pastor or somebody in that role, they'll say, yeah, I'll do it, right? Because it's kind of like, here's a great suggestion. But what I really love about this church is, yeah, you let me know what you need, but you lead it. And guess what? I, I didn't blink at it. I didn't, I didn't fault on it or whatever. And we did it, and, I, and I'll never forget that we, we had, it was, it was just, I think, maybe five or six kids up here. Uh, Zeke was up here. Noah was up here. I think Matt was up here. It was a, a stinky sheep thing. Noah, you remember that? I see you smiling back there. Uh, yeah, and so it was so good, and, but I loved it. And so since then, I just knew. I was like, okay, I can do this because I, I, feel, I saw a need in the church, took the lead, accomplished it, and no, it wasn't easy but I just was obedient to that. And so that was, that was where I, that's an example. Anyone else? Uh, for me, I've, since like I was a young kid, I've always really just had a gravitation towards student ministry. Um, at my church, I grew up in a small church, Jeff Applin, who a lot of y'all know, was our youth pastor at that church. And it always seemed like 
student ministry or youth ministry always got to do the really fun stuff. Like they'd go play paintball or they would have like lockouts or lock-ins. And I was always like, oh man, that's really good. And now I'm doing that. I'm like, that's really dangerous and stupid. Um, but <laughs> ever since I was a young kid, like I always just kind of gravitated towards that. And there was always, it seemed to me like in Jeff's ministry, there was always like a set like leader. Like there was somebody that kind of led that ministry. Jeff was the student pastor. But, like, there was always, like, a student that just kind of filled that void and kind of was, like, the leader for the group. Um, and so when I hit student ministry, um, you know, in seventh grade at that church, I'm watching it. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think there's, like, that guy anymore. I don't think that guy that was there when I was a kid, I don't think he's here anymore. I'm like, I'm in the seventh grade. This is too young of an age to try to captain this ship. Um, and so I didn't. And so I just sat there and. Our student ministry was stagnant and didn't do a lot and didn't see a lot of spiritual progression. Um, fast forward, we left that church and ended up at Agape a couple years later. And it's kind of a deal where the student ministry in itself was kind of being birthed out of nothing. Um, James and Blake Moss were very much trying to like build a student ministry for our church. And I was probably in ninth or 10th grade and just watching this rise up and again I'm looking for that guy I'm like who's that guy who's that girl that's gonna like lead this and I never really saw it and again I was like well 10th grade is still too young to be doing this so to wrap it all up I slowly over the next couple of years through Blake and through James started to fill that role until James just kind of marked hey like God's got a calling for your life in this and he didn't really had to tell me because I could already feel the Lord kind of stirring that as I was finishing high school. Like, hey, I think, this is, I think this is what I want to do for the rest of my life is like have young people have a radical encounter with God. Um, and so just over the years through different means and different transitions, we're here. Yeah. So, yeah. Excellent. You know, with, with leadership in the church, it's really interesting because sometimes you're prompted, sometimes you're called. Right. Sometimes you have that internal desire, but sometimes somebody's got to speak to you to kind of, to kind of, you know, push you off the boat onto that water. Right. So that that's interesting. That's great. And I say it's interesting because <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. Right. You never know which one you're going to be. The, the issue is, is are you willing to be obedient to either one of them? So let's go over here to Jeff and Kim, our campus pastors. So. Um, just real briefly, you know, why did you accept the role of campus pastors? And of course, with that, I mean, that's, that's, that's a heavy, it's a heavy lift, right? And so what fears have you faced or overcome in your new role? Well, there's a, it was a, it was a um, surprise and shock when we were talking to Pastor James about it. And fear was just like overthinking. We had so many different questions, like, I mean, a ton of different questions. First of all, my pastor, my mentor is kind of <laughs> not leading, just expanding, right? And it was kind of one of those times where you're thinking like, well, will anybody show up the first Sunday in January? They did. They're still here. Okay. And or, we thank you. But yeah, they're, they're, we're still going. But just like the show up and then can we, can we give enough time to continue to do things in excellence? Everything that we do as a church, as a church body, we got to do an excellence. And our schedule's so busy, and it, man, it was a prayer. It was like, Lord, show us. I mean, we went home, and we were still, I, I remember on the drive home, we're still like, what in the world just happened? <laughs> and, and, you know, Pastor James, so, so there was a fear of um, just being able to continue to do the things in excellence as Pastor James always led us. But, you know, going through training and going through coming off other ministries that we've, we've been involved with, and it was like, so we get home, and Kim's like, man, I, and she actually said it in the meeting. She's like, she starts crying, and we, we talked about this before, and we had a picture of her journal. She journaled, in five years, Jeff will be asked to pastor a guy. Five years ago. And I don't know, if, if you wasn't here, we had a, a picture of it, and it was in 2018, correct? It was in 2018, and we get, got asked in 2023. Hmm. How detailed our God is. Yeah. And, and, the, and, and it comes down to that Kim was obedient to the Holy Spirit, as we talked earlier, and she journaled. So I, I, I often question, like, if she would not have journaled that, 
would we be here today, right? Mm. Would we be in the position? Would we be in this, this whole thing? Because what I say earlier, you got to get rid of the word coincidence. Because I would have been like, oh, that's just a coincidence, right? That's good. And it was her obeying the Holy Spirit, putting it in her daily journal, and to the detail of in five years. So five years later, it comes, and we get asked, and once you read that, and you read it from 2018, and God's opened that door and kicked you into it, what do you do? You have to say yes, right? And yeah. you have to go. But the coolest thing is watching the team from the staff to the trustees to the, to the um, serve team as you watch people step up into positions that they wasn't at before, right? And you watch the people grow, and you watch the people step up and say, hey, Jeff, hey, man, if you got a problem in this area, let me know. Or, or, or Jeff, don't worry about this. I got it. It's been really cool to watch um, just their growth. I mean, being campus pastor is great, and we do, but it takes a whole, the serve team is amazing here at Agape Church, and I really commend each and every one of you that stepped up to, to make this thing happen. So I say probably if, if we hadn't have had that journal entry, I would have said no, at least, because <laughs> we have so much things going on. But I really appreciate God um, giving me things like those burning bush moments where you can't deny if you did, you would be walking in rebellion. Um, some challenges for me personally as we, we have walked into this role is just um, a lot of insecurities have came to the surface for me, and they're new. Um, I love Joyce Meyer. She, she says a lot, new level is new devil. And um, recognizing insecurities, I mean, first and foremost, I'm a female. You know, a female pastor is, and that's different for me. That's new, you know, and, and that's came up to the surface since, since um, we have filled this role. And that's hard because, like, I guess just finding my roots in, in, because people question and people say stupid things and people say, you know, whether they're saying it to my face or not, I know those things, you can feel it. But just finding my confidence in the word and being able to go, okay, here is scripture that this woman was an apostle and that this woman was a prophet and that this woman was a pastor and knowing that and be able to face that insecurity in the eye and say, no, hell, you're a liar, you know, but it was a direct attack on my identity. Um, and that, that has been a challenge for me, but any, you know, I always say like God reveals to remove. So any insecurity that comes to the surface, okay, Lord, you're, you've given me the grace to deal with this. So your strength is made perfect in my weakness. So here's a really weak area that I have, but he just has taught me to just get in scripture with that. And he defends my reputation. So that's good. That's good. You know, what's so interesting is, is I'm sitting over here and, and I'm, and we hear the difference, the two different stories, but they're married, right? They're, they're feeding off of each other. And so when I, when I hear your stories, I hear boldness in the faith. And, and for you, I hear peace from closure, right? And, and so how much does that, that contrast each other, you know, just on our daily lives, you know, and, and outside of just the church? And so I just want to encourage you to that, you know. It sounds like she's going to help you keep you grounded, but yet you're going to help her continue to dream big. And so let's continue going there. All right. I'm going to shift over here, and this is a question for Josh and Becky. And so the question is this, is how do you find fulfillment in God as a single person, especially when you want to be in a relationship? I think um, for me, I always keep Matthew 6.33 in mind. You know, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be... Um, provided for you. And I know in context, that verse is talking about they're worrying about what they eat, what they drink, what they should wear, and all those things. But I think that extends to all things. Um, so that could include like who to marry, whether or not to marry. So I think for me, as long as I am seeking first his kingdom, my God fulfills everything. Yeah. Like he fulfills every need. Um, even if the desire is still there, he's still very much a comforter. Um, and there are a lot of things to do for his kingdom. So, like, I'm you not. stay busy. Yeah, I'm not not busy. Um, <laughs> and another verse that's encouraging is just listening to Paul. I mean, he was single and he, 
as by his own admission, the greatest apostle. Um, so <laughs> right, right, right. He did so much, and like he, he talked about how he who finds a wife is a good thing, but he also talked how singleness is a good thing. Um, he said, like, it's my wish for, for everybody to be like I am, but if you need to, go ahead and marry. So I'm not lacking anything. Yeah. Um, he actually calls singleness and marriage a gift. They're both gifts, and I don't need to compare my gift to someone else's. I need to use the gift that God has given me in this season fully. Um, so I can see the blessings in being single because I'm able to stay later. I'm able to go to more. I'm able to do more because I don't have to, you know, check in with somebody or take care of kids and all those things. And those are areas that the church needs, you know. Um, and I think another way that has helped me is to stay sober-minded about marriage. Um, and my advice to single people would be, if, you don't, if you're not a third wheel in a healthy marriage, I suggest that you become one. Because <laughs> it, it helps you see how beautiful marriage is, but it also helps you see how much work it takes. Um, and that keeps me very sober-minded, because it's not like I'm going to get married and all my problems are going away. It's not like it's going to fill any hole in my heart or anything like that. So it keeps me very aware of like what it takes to be in a healthy marriage and how much work it takes, how beautiful it is. But, you know, when I go home, if there's an issue earlier, I don't have to talk to anybody about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. There's no like, we need to talk about what happened earlier. It's like, nope, it's me and Mason. We're going for a walk and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's I good. think there, there's just being sober minded about what that is and just taking advantage of the opportunities that I have in the season that I'm in. Yeah, and I just want to echo something Becky just said. Like, there's there's nothing I lack. There's there's no season of life that God's given to me, and I guess to anyone, where He says like, "Hey, you know, you're only sufficient to do My will if you're this." Like God's called us. Hey, beyond everything, there's in any season, God has a will for your life. God has a plan for your life. My dad used to have a keychain or part of a um, something that went on a keychain. Um, but it said, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, uh, plans to give you a hope and a future. And he used to echo that over mine and my brother's life. Like, guys, hey, you know, the Lord knows the plans he has for you. The Lord knows every next step that you have to take. Um, and so just honestly answering the question, like, I've never found this season of singleness lacking. Like, I've never found... You know, I can't do ministry until I'm married. I can't do this until I'm married. I can't step out into my calling until I'm married. Like, it's always just felt like, no, I'm going to do this. And like Becky said, Paul says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And just from there saying, hey, and then once I find that person, I will continue to walk in the same calling God has for me with the gift alongside of me in a wife. Um, you look at biblical characters. Uh, Becky just talked about it. Paul, single. Um, David slaughtered Goliath, single. Jesus, the son of God, walked his entire earthly ministry out, single. Like there's not, there's not a direct calling that if you're single, God can't use you. Like that's a lie from the enemy. And we reject that in Jesus' name, absolutely. Yeah. So, No, you're right. And I think, you know, a lot of this, you know, perception of what a, perfect life looks like, whether you're, you're looking at it from a single lens or, or a married lens, it's all just some worldview that's, that's gotten away from, from Scripture. And again, you know, one thing that I love about us all answering these questions is that there's that reference to the Word. You know, it's the reference to the Word, it's the reference to the realization and that perception that no matter what season we're in, no matter who we are with, the calling is still, is still there, right? That's great. Appreciate you guys sharing that. Um, Next one's going to be a, a little, you know, I think might be something that, um, it, this could be something for everyone in the room, right? So as we're, as we're talking about and as we are um, asking these questions, I, I hope you also are kind of answering them for yourself, right? That we want you to be responsive, and while the, we only want the, the panel members right now to answer, we're going to have an opportunity to be responsive in some way. And so just stay connected with us here for the next few questions. But this next one is, is, it could be tough for some folks, okay? So, have you ever experienced church hurt? Have you ever experienced being hurt from the church? And Josh, I know that you've spoken about this before. Would you mind just kind of going into this one with us? Yeah. Um, so, as 
many of you know, as I've talked about a couple times here from the platform or maybe just in small groups, um, the way I found myself to Agape was through church hurt. Um, so I always will say, like, that season of life wasn't wasted because it led me here. Um, and I'm thankful to the Lord for that. But um, we, I grew up in the church that my mom grew up in and the small Southern Baptist church. And I'm thankful for those years in the church. It's taught me a lot through my Christian walk. Um, it taught me a love and a reverence for the word of God um, that I have built upon here at Agape. Um, but yeah, I, I, we walked through a season where, you know, the church was actively being called, hey, we want to go out. We want to make disciples of all nations. Um, just enacting the Great Commission and leading us where the Lord had called us. And there was a lot of pushback from the church. Like, hey, we, we're good where we're at. You know, yeah. we've always been a small church, always kept it <clears throat> this size. More specifically, always kept it a certain color. Um, and so we started to push back against that. And we're like, hey, this is, this is absolutely not scriptural. This is against the word of God. And we were just met with, hey, you know, this is how it's always been. This is how it's always going to be. Well, thank God for Carlin and Kelly Pugh who said, no, this is not how it's always going to be. Um, and so we left. And it just, it, it hurt for the longest time. And for so many, even my first couple of years at Agape, I lived in kind of just this, um, this hurt, this, had this bitterness for the specific, like, traditional church um, for even, I'll be honest, even for, like, Southern Baptist churches, I was like, this is how they all are. Every church is like this. They, every single one of them have this idea. They have this way of thinking. And, again, that's a lie from the enemy used to divide and to divide the body of Christ. And so it was here that I found, you know, not all people are like that. Never once did James get up here and say, hey, I just want to let you know, Southern Baptist people are not bad people. But it was through him opening the word and us having community with other churches in our area that we learned, like, hey, you know, that's, that's absolutely a lie from the enemy. You used to divide. Yeah. Um, so just I would encourage even in that, you know, if there is church hurt, and I believe it's absolutely valid, um, number one, figure out where the lie is that's keeping you bitter, keeping you angry. Um, and number two, big one, don't blame Jesus for it. Just a lot of people will flip it and say, like, that was Jesus. Jesus did that. God did that. Why would a loving God allow that to happen to me? Why would a loving God teach this way and his people act this way? Again, what is it? It's a lie. It's absolutely a lie. And so I would, number one, remove that. Number two, don't blame Jesus for it. That's good. Thank you, Josh. I know personally I, I too, have had an experience with church hurt. I was at a uh, another traditional, you know, church, very, very strong in um, in the tradition, religious aspects of it. And it was, a, but the thing about it, it was a great church, right? It, and again, you can't label all of you know Southern Baptist churches. Uh, well, they're all like this, right? There were some great aspects of it, but I was also involved in the in the with the students and the and the kids at that time, and. We had a vacation Bible school, and we invited, it was, a tradition, it was a white church, let's just call it what it was, it was a white church, we invited some black kids to it, all right? A lot, half the church did not like that, but you know what we did? We kept inviting them to church, <laughs> and that, they didn't like that either, and then they wanted to sing in the choir, and so we let them sing in the choir, and well, it, it was awesome. Until it wasn't. It was awesome until it wasn't. And then, you know, at that time, what, what happened was there was just some behind-the-scenes meetings, you know. And then all of a sudden, there's rumblings, and then it's the pastor's fault, you know. And then it's the deacon's fault, or the deacon, is, it's, it's an uprising, you know. And I'll never forget, I was at this meeting. It was a, they called a meeting on a Sunday night or a midweek night, I can't remember. And, and we got up, and people made arguments for or against and the ones who brought the word and the ones who gave biblical examples were the ones that were completely dismissed. And I was, I, I remember thinking, I was like, this is, this is not right. This is not what it's supposed to look like. It's not what it's supposed to be. And that, that has always stuck with me. 
you know, and I was mad, but then I was remembering, you know, anger is only a secondary emotion. Let's remember that, okay? You're angry because of something. And I was angry because I, I, I was just disappointed. You know, the expectations had shifted and changed. And so if that's you today, I just want you just to be thinking about that because that's, that, that's very real for a lot of people, right? But there's freedom in the word. And I remember coming to my first Sunday at Agape Church. I was invited by Becky and I sat right over there and James was doing the Ask the Pastor series. And I remember thinking to myself, man, if a pastor is willing to hear from the congregation and actually preach from what is actually on their minds, instead of taking this stance of, I will tell you what to think, whew, man, there's some freedom there. There's some freedom there. All right. So next question, Jeff, this one's going to be for you. Why is unity so important to the success of not only churches in general, but specifically our church? I think you can uh, almost piggyback off what you guys just discussed. Um, so, you know, the unity, first of all, in Philippians 2, 2, it says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being a one accord, and a one mind. So I think so many people, and I heard this at, just the other day, um, the religion, the religion, the theology, you know, that's all up here. But until you follow the Holy Spirit, there's going to be so much division. So the opposite of unity is, is division. And so division is going to tear down everything. If we're not, as it says, on one accord, on one mind, if we're not, if we're thinking different, if they want this kind and they want that kind or they do this and and we all put it to our personal agenda, just like Russell talked about, if it's biblical. I mean, we, we go through the word, right? And if it's biblical, that's the way we follow it. But when we put it to our personal agenda and our own liking, it starts to make division, which division means destroying. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I, I loved about Pastor James when he would pray, when we first came here seven years ago, we would, uh, he would pray, and he would pray for all the other churches. He would call out pastors, pastors that I know, churches, churches that I know. And it was like, how awesome, because what is unity? Unity is, I mean, this, this is agape, and I love this church, but I love a bunch of churches, right? Because we're, we're, we're not here for, we don't praise and worship agape, right? We're, we're team Jesus. Yeah. And if we have that mindset that we're team Jesus, and hey, if we want to partner with another church, Let's partner with them. Because what's the job? What is our job? Our job is to win the lost. I don't want to build agape from other church members. I don't want to build agape because um, someone, you know, if, if somebody decides to come here, we'll welcome them for sure. We came from another church, but we don't go fishing. We're not fishers of men in other churches. We're fishers of men of the, the people that don't know Jesus, don't have a relationship with Jesus, the people that are lost, the hurt. So the, the unity thing is, is so important that right here that we keep strife out, we keep gossip out, we keep that division out to stay united to win the lost. That's good. So um, the, the church hurt with, with Russell and Josh, and, and I think it just comes so much from tradition. It comes so much from uh, the spirit of religion. Let's just be honest, right? I mean, we, we, we're here to have a relationship with Jesus, nothing about religion. Yeah, that's good. Okay, excellent, excellent. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing. And so, you know, when we're, when we're speaking of moving past that religious heart, right, that religious atmosphere, and really getting into the relationship with Jesus, it, it leads right into our, our next question, and it's how do you share your faith with a stranger? And how do you overcome the fear of being looked at as a, as a weird person or one of, one of those Christians? Now, look, y'all y'all know, y'all in the, now, we don't go to the mall anymore, but in the mall, there was, you know, you could, you could, you could spot a Christian youth group on vacation doing some scavenger hunt somewhere in the mall. Like, oh gosh, here we go. Josh has got his group looking for somebody with a pink shirt to sign something or take a selfie, right? 
But, but when we get down to it, how do we share our faith with a stranger? Um, Becky, you've been, you haven't missed a mission trip yet that we've been on, <laughs> praise God, and, we, and we're, moved, we're, we're all going to Italy um, this summer to share our faith and to, and to share the gospel. So, so how, how do you approach it? I, I love this question because even though I've been on five mission trips, um, I had not shared my faith directly with someone or specifically asked someone like, hey, do you know Jesus? What's your relationship like with Christ? Do you know God? Until that first one in Germany. Yeah. And I was 31 years old. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, if I had been, you know, Michael went with us last year. If I had been her age and started from there sharing the gospel, like, oh my gosh, what a force. Mm-hmm. Like, if we could start our kids off earlier to share in that, that'll be huge. And I think it starts with just looking at yourself. And I mean, practically... Um, I can share what we do in our mission trip training. We start with God. We talk about sin. We talk about Jesus, repentance, and you had faith in there for a little razzle-dazzle. Um, but uh, <laughs> I think um, if you can hit on those key points, you can share the gospel. And I think your testimony is what makes that real to someone. Because we can all say, you know, there's a God that created me. I sin. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save me from my sin. I have turned away from the ways of the world, and I turn towards Jesus, and I have faith that I will live forever with him. And the details of your story are what's going to make that connect with someone and what's going to make them see that it's real. I mean, Agape Kids does this with ABCs, admit, believe, and commit. Mm -hmm. Um, And in that way, you can share it practically. Now, for the other part, as far as not looking weird, um, I don't have any advice on how not to look weird because you're just going to be weird. (laughs) My advice is just embrace the weird. And when we go on mission trips and I go up to people, I do is like, can I ask you a weird question? Can I ask you something that's going to make you uncomfortable? Um, And I just start with that because I already know um, it's going to get weird, but in the best way possible. And one of the guys that leads our, our... Mr. when we went with European Initiative, he would say, I don't care how uncomfortable I make them, I'm having the most important conversation they will ever have in their entire life. Yeah. Like when we really think about what's on the line, I don't care how uncomfortable I am. And part of that is just one being, having the fear of the Lord greater than the fear of man. And by fear of the Lord, I mean like your reverence for him, your gratefulness to him for what he's done for you. And I mean, if we had a friend or if we had a stranger that was walking towards the edge of the cliff, I wouldn't care how weird I look to people yelling and screaming for them to stop. Yeah. I'm trying to save their life. That's right. Um, now, I'm not doing the saving Jesus is, but through a little conversation, their whole world could change. And that's worth it. Mm-hmm. That's worth it. If, I, if people are going to call me the weird, don't, you know, don't go to her. She's going to talk to you about Jesus. Then <laughs> good. Yeah. Like that, <laughs> because when they get into a real situation in life, who are they going to come and find? The person who's been talking about Jesus, That's right. the person who has been sharing the faith, the person who is exuding what it means to have a radical transformation from Jesus Christ in their life when something real happens. So I say all that to say just like it, it's worth it to be uncomfortable. It's worth it. And it, it's not easy. Like even on when we go now, like I have to like tell myself, like, I know I'm tired. I don't want to do this, but Holy Spirit, please give me the strength (laughs) and just give me the words to say. Um, You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have gone to seminary. You just need to have a relationship with Christ. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. In the book, uh, Acts 1-8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be a witness to me, all the ends of the earth. Our job is to be witnesses, right? Our job is to be, that's that's in red letters, that's Jesus telling us, and like it comes that you just have to go with boldness. Uh, is it hard, is it different? Sure, but you just gotta get over that and to just go in boldness to be that guy, to be like Becky um, killed it, like you're saving lives through Jesus Christ, but you, like you're a lifesaver through Jesus Christ. And the, and the weird part, strange part, we'll call it, you know, we don't care to be weird of the world, right? And we don't care to whatever that looks like. It's like we, Todd White said, that we feast 
on the world, and we just want to taste test Jesus. It's so powerful. Like, we're so worried about what everyone thinks and says. But there's an eternity that we have to live. And there's a, there's a thing that, like, that I don't want to just be a taste tester of Jesus and give all my life to the world, right? So we're okay with, with going all out in the world. Just the people, not, not me, not us, but, like, just the, the people is just like, oh, it's okay. We'll just be part of it. It's scripture that we're not going to be part of this world, right? We, we don't do that. We're, it's it's um, that we, we, we give so much. So if, if, we call, if we're called weird, if we're called strange, if we're whatever it is, I'm, like Becky said, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with, with that happening because, hey, my Lord has given me more than I've ever been worthy. So I, I think that we just go into it, and I think that we just say we accept it. Because I, 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 I like to look at it like if Jesus walked into the Capital C Church. Yep. Think about it, guys. Think about what the, the church heard that Russell and Josh just talked about. If Jesus walked into the church, how would he be looked at? Strange. Unfortunately, I believe that. I believe that he would be looked at different. Like, man, what do you— who is this? What's this in here for? Right? So I just believe, hey, if it's weird, if it's strange, it's boldness that we know what we're doing, it's biblical, and we keep on doing what we're doing. That's good, Jeff. Thank you. Um, you know, the thing about it, too, when you're sharing your faith is everybody thinks that you have to be a preacher. I feel like everybody thinks that you've got to have, like you say, a doctorate in preaching or, or some seminary thing, but you don't. You have your story. You have your favorite Bible verse, you know, or something like that. You've got, you know, throw them some word, throw them some love, and just talk with people. Just talk with people. Um, you know, we're going through our, our practice right now, you know, just getting ready for, for Italy. And the first thing we, we did was, as we said, okay, tell me everything that's good that's happened in your life. Just, just the highlights, you know, just that 3,000 foot view. Let's just, let's just hear it. And they listened to them. I said, and I said, well, tell me all the bad things now. You know, and of course, that line is a lot longer. You know, everybody loves, misery loves company, right? But then one of them said, I think it was you, Keisha, who said, but I see where a bad thing correlated to a good thing. That is a testimony moment. And that story is something that someone needs to be heard. And I don't care if it's in Italy. I don't care if it's in Kenya, Prague, Budapest, Spain, Madrid, or Germany, or any other member of the EU. It could also be someone in this room or at a sm during a small group or someone out on the streets visiting Laurel, Mississippi. So again, like we've talked about, when we're talking about sharing our faith, you got to listen to the Holy Spirit. That prompting, that physical urge, that physical just something, heart starts beating fast, palm, sweaty palms, whatever, wipe them off before you shake their hand, you know? But just act, just act. Thank you guys for sharing that. Okay, and so for our last question, I'd like to start with Kim here. And so this is a tough one. And so again, um, let's, just, let's just dive in. So how do you deal with sin in your personal relationship with the Lord? And how long does it take to you, for you to recover from a spiritual failure, if you want to label it like that? This is the one that no one wants to talk about, right? Guys, I've been, I've been living for the Lord since 2006, and I've messed up so many times. Um, prideful, watch pride in your life, because the word says that pride comes before a fall, and I have fallen so many times. Um, but sin is alive, and um, Scripture tells us in James 1, 13 through 15, that when desire gives birth, that that's when sin is born, and that that sin then grows and so that tells me that if sin can grow that it is alive and what you feed is what's going to grow so I say that that you know if we have I guess an analogy would be you know if I cut the circulation off of my wrist and I kept it I kept it completely just where there was no blood flow to that what would happen eventually my hand would fall off however 
if I cut the circulation off of my wrist and then I was uncomfortable for a few days or even a week and I, I gave circuit, I gave life back to it and then I decided, you know what, I, I really don't want this anymore so so I tightened the circuit and I, I just did not give it in, but the whole time I'm just miserable. You know, the greatest thing to do with sin is to let it die and the way that I've done that was um, educate yourself about the price of sin. Um, Proverbs. Proverbs is so full. Proverbs is my favorite book of the Bible, but it's so full of what happens when we sin. You know, just a few. Proverbs 14.30 talks about envy and bitterness rots, literally rots our bones. You know, and it talks about uh, the price of adultery in Proverbs 7, 22 through 23. It says that a man, whenever he, that he leads himself to the grave, when a man commits adultery, that, that is like a spear going into his liver. You know, that, that's real stuff that comes out of the word of God. But when you educate yourself about the price of sin, and I say Proverbs is a really great book to start with, like it, it hits different. It's different because then you're like, okay, for me to have this one little thing, for me to continually, continually do this one thing that is pleasing, that it's costing me something, you know, and then to let that go, it's so much easier to let that die in your life. But um, to recover from that, guys, confess quickly. You know, my mouth gets me in trouble so much. I say things that I shouldn't say, and sometimes I know it. You know, sometimes I, it's easier to push, so many times it's easier to push past that Holy Spirit, that little gentle nudge, than it is to stop in mid-sentence and say, you know what, I shouldn't have said that. You know, but, but to be able to heed that and to say, this is hurtful when I'm saying it, and I shouldn't talk about this person, or I shouldn't talk, or I should just keep my mouth shut, you know, but confess quickly. And that way it loses its power because when you confess something, it no longer has power in your life. But it is at that point that we try to hide sin, that it becomes deadly. You know, right after that scripture, it talks about that the wages of sin is death, you know, and I do believe that it affects us in our health. However, confess quickly and educate yourself about the price of sin and what you are paying for that, that habitual sin that you are not giving up and what that's doing to you and to your family and to your life. And then how long does it take me to get up? That's up to you. <laughs> that's, that's up to you. And, and like be able to recognize that whenever I confess something, when you confess something, okay, Lord, forgive me for saying this. It doesn't matter how great or how small it feels. When you confess that, it loses its power. Anything past that is guilt and condemnation. And the word says that there is no condemnation in Christ. So that he cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. So literally you're beating yourself up about something that God does not even remember. Like he, is, he doesn't know what you're talking about. Like you're doing that to yourself. So how long does it take you to get up from? Confess it. If you need to go to someone and make it right, do that. But then past that is just get up get up from it. Like, don't let that guilt and that shame speak or take from you any longer. When you say, you know, when the question's asked, like, how long do you, does it take to recover? You know, I think of, um, like a sports injury. You know, when you're, when you, when you have an at when, an athlete that, that gets hurt, a professional athlete or whatever, there has to be a, a plan for that. Whether you tear an ACL or roll an ankle or hurt your back, lifting weights or whatever, there has to be a process of, of healing, right? And so if you do have a setback, that's not the end of the world. You can still move, but you've got to get yourself on a trajectory for recovery. And so spiritually, what does that look like, right? That's praying, that's getting into the word, that's, that's seeking help from other people, finding freedom in the spoken word. It's, it's finding that, that brother or sister that you know has got your back, that's willing to confess and, and just kind of be that accountability partner for you. And so as we finish up today, 
Um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, thank you so much, panel, for, for answering the questions.